Good morning. You're very welcome to this Your Active Debate brought to you with the mission of China to the EU. Today we're going to be talking about carbon neutrality and asking how the EU and China can work together to deliver a carbon neutral future and a lead global change, change efforts. So do join us on your social media channel. Follow the hashtag EA Debates. We will also be taking questions live via our platform and you can submit them there in the Q&A box. With that, I will introduce our panelists. They will all then give us a couple of minutes introduction to their background and their interest in this area before we begin our general discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. To begin, we have Alina Bardrum, who is Acting Director of International Mainstreaming and Policy Coordination from DG Climate, that the Climate Department within the European Commission. We also have Lydia Piera, who is an MEP and member of the Delegation for Relations with the People's Republic of China. She's also a member of ECON and a substitute in the MV, the Environment Committee, within the European Parliament. Alexandra Leiteo is the Portuguese Special Envoy for Climate Affairs and, of course, Portugal holding the rotating presidency at the moment in the EU. We have Edmond Alafandre, who is Chairman of the Task Force on on carbon pricing in Europe, and also very well known as a former minister in France. Bifod Sang is the senior policy advisor of the climate diplomacy team at E3G. He Jiang is the executive director Deputy Director at the Institute of Energy Transition and Social Development at the Tsinghua University in China. And Fei Shengzhao is the Minister Councillor at the Mission of the EU to, of China to the EU. So thank you all. We have a really packed schedule and so many experts. It's delightful to see you all this morning. So with that, I'm going to hand over and give you a couple of minutes each just to introduce yourselves. Elena, let me start with you. Thanks very much, Jennifer, and, and uh, good morning to everyone. We're here rather early, but it's a, a privilege to see such distinguished uh, co-panelists. So as Jennifer mentioned, I am uh, acting as the director uh, for international mainstreaming and uh, policy coordination in DG Climate Action. And uh, for the past uh, almost 11 years, I've been in DG Climate Action. And before that, I worked on external relations and did some academic work on the impacts of globalization. Um, I also uh, worked as the head of the EU delegation to the UNFCCC negotiations between uh, 2014 and 2019. Uh, so quite uh, significant years from Lima to Katowice. And that, of course, includes the very important negotiations on, on the Paris Agreement, a bit of a landmark for, for many of us. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to our representative from the European Parliament today. Lydia, the floor is yours. Good morning to everyone and thank you very much for the invitation. I would also like to congratulate my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, panelists. Uh, well, indeed, I'm a member of the European Parliament since uh, 2019. I'm, I also, I'm also the president of the Youth of the European People's Party. And uh, for us, it has been a very important topic, uh, the environment. Um, also in my political agenda, uh, this is one of the most important topics for me, together with economics, and hence uh, the reason why I'm a, a member, a, a permanent member in the Econ Committee and a substitute in, in Envy. I think there's a lot of challenges coming that are ahead of us, uh, also uh, during the, re the time for the economic recovery after the pandemic, but there's uh, something very important that we have to discuss which is uh, how we can cooperate to make sure that we can reach, we can have uh, a, a climate neutral planet by 2050. Um, I know it's not, it's a very ambitious goal, at least the, the European continent is, uh, is doing its part, but we need our uh, colleagues and friends from around the world so we can meet the targets. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've said it well. There are challenges ahead, but we will try to discuss and tackle some of those challenges this morning. Alexandra, let me hand over to you and give us your perspective. Well, uh, thank you, Mrs. Baker, uh, Honourable Member of the European Parliament, the Minister Council of the Mission of China, dear colleagues of panel, ladies and gentlemen, I am honoured by the invitation of our active to participate in this conference. Thank you for the opportunity and I will be speaking on behalf of Portugal, of course. 
I am a Portuguese diplomat. I am currently a special envoy for climate and member of the second UN Ocean Conference Steering Committee. Previously, I worked in many places, but uh, between 2016 and 19, I worked as EU ambassador to Timor-Leste. Allow me to make a few remarks, introductory remarks. On the 25th January, the Foreign Affairs Council debated the climate and energy diplomacy. For this exercise, Portugal presented its contribution through an on-paper called Climate Action, giving a new world to the world. We believe that three concepts are key to a well-succeeded climate and energy diplomacy. The first is to achieve Paris targets. We need to bring all countries on board. No country or region can do this alone. Second, this will require a lot of patient and persistent dialogue. For the Portuguese diplomacy, forged by long-lasting relationships around the world, no country can be excluded from dialogue and negotiation. It means that we must be able to put ourselves in others' shoes, understanding their circumstances and problems in order to find common solutions. Three, it also means leading by example and showcasing that green transition may be a powerful engine for economic growth and job creation. Thus, it also means that transition must be fair. In this framework, new intensity renewable energies must be available at competitive price. Smart energy grids must be deeply interlinked with efficient interconnections and the blue economy must be leveraged. The beginning of vaccination against COVID-19 will desirably trigger a strong global economic recovery, but it will also inevitably create greater energy consumption and more pollution. China, as the world's largest emitter, is a key player to avoid that recovery worsens the climate emergency. We welcome China's announcement on a specific target for carbon neutrality by 2060, but to allow us, Mr. Cheng Chao, to invite your country to join the European ambition of 2050. We know that it is not easy, but we also know that it's impossible to meet Paris targets without countries like China, the US, India, Russia, or Brazil. Portugal has a unique experience of relationship with China of more than 500 years. And we know that there is little that China and the EU together cannot achieve. Trust will be everything in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Uh, let us turn now uh, to Edmond Alafandre. Tell us a bit more about the task force. Okay, first, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored and pleased to participate to this panel. Uh, I am uh, an economist, uh, a businessman uh, in the energy sector for 25 years, and a former policymaker. And like economists, like more and more policymakers and uh, more and more business leaders, uh, I am convinced that the price of carbon is the best device we have at our disposal uh, to fight uh, global warming. For a very simple reason, the higher the price of carbon, the most costly its emission. And uh, for all those who uh, in act whose activities uh, emit carbon. Uh, uh, why did I uh, create the tax force on carbon pricing in Europe? In the EU, uh, we launched a market for carbon in 2005 uh, with a price of carbon above, at the time, 30 euro per ton. Then came the great financial crisis. And then uh, there has been a collapse of the demand for energy and the price of carbon collapsed leading to a complete lack of efficiency. Over the last two years, the price of carbon uh, uh, rose again due to enhanced um, uh, uh, ambition in the uh, uh, in, uh, reduction uh, of emission in Europe. And the European authorities uh, understood as well that they should avoid the volatility of the price of carbon. And now, as you see, despite the COVID-19 crisis, the price of carbon is up to uh, 35 euro per ton. Uh, and I think that the European institution must be congratulated uh, because it has already a uh, positive impact on decarbonization. There is still a lot of, pro of, pro of, of progress to make, uh, mainly to target uh, the, the price of carbon uh, to enhance its efficiency 
And this is the purpose of, uh, of the tax laws. And now, uh, just a, a word on China. China is extremely important because climate change is a global challenge, and uh, China is a key actor in this respect. Um, let me stress, like the predecessor, the, 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 the predecessor speaking, that um, this country is making significant steps in the right direction. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, um, has pledged for China to carbon neutrality by 2060. A national market for carbon is to be launched in the, in the coming days. And uh, many decisions are being taken to stiffen emissions of carbon. 18 months ago, I had the opportunity to explain to China, France, of the think tank, the International Finance Forum, the objective of, the, of the, our tax force in Europe uh, on carbon pricing. And I launched the idea of a joint initiative uh, to promote a convergence price of carbon between China and the EU. And my Chinese friends liked it. We even uh, uh, published uh, uh, together in China Delhi an op-ed for a convergence price of carbon between China and Europe. And our common ambition uh, through this joint initiative is to develop a nucleus to promote a global level play, play, playing field uh, to fight global warming through the most efficient device we have available, which is the price of carbon. Thank you. Thank you very much for that and for that strong background. Let me turn now to Baifa Chang. Um, give us your perspective. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Director, for having me in the event and, and good to meet uh, the, such a strong uh, panel. So, um, um, so I'm from E3G um, and we are a, a international climate change think tank uh, working for a safe climate forum. So uh, my interest is to uh, research uh, on EU-China climate diplomacy. So we are working to facilitate that conversation, at least at the uh, civil society level uh, between EU and China, so that we can think about solutions to that EU and China can cooperate together. So, and the reason that we're interested in this is because climate is a shared existential threat by the EU and China. China is acutely uh, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And on the flip side, China's decision, um, well, as the world's largest emitter, will also have impact on European climate safety. And, and also for Europe, like for the European Green Deal and the objectives to be successful, like the EU will need to work with uh, partners, including China, to build resilient supply chains uh, and markets for low carbon technologies and develop standards uh, to spur that growth in uh, sustainable products um, and the same apply for China. So it's in, in EU's and China's common interest to work together to overcome that challenge. And EU and China are already working together in the, over the past decade or so on various things, on working to get together on um, exchanges on the emissions trading scheme, on development of sustainable finance standards, uh, on energy uh, and on environmental governance. So, so that's already ongoing. But what I also want to touch on uh, today is that is to highlight some of the change in, in the context and in the, in the kind of the political space that we're operating in. Uh, in the past year, and how would this dynamics change the cooperation uh, between the two? So, um, so the first dynamic I want to highlight is obviously COVID, uh, which is affecting uh, all of us uh, in the world. Um, and because of COVID, there are large amounts of recovery funds um, in the EU and China going into a lot of various sectors, uh, including uh, green and low carbon sectors. And a lot of the financial decisions and the investment decisions uh, of the government that was going to be made in five or six years time is now has to be made in the next two years. So um, it provides us with an opportunity to think about how do we make the best use of these funds to uh, align uh, policies and our economy with uh, net zero, uh, the net zero target, the respective net zero targets that the EU and China has made. Um, and, and also the EU has been starting to do, has started doing that with the next generation uh, EU funds and uh, in China, um, a focus on new infrastructure and smart infrastructure. And the second dynamics I want to highlight is the, um, is the fact that uh, net zero is now becoming a new normal. So we, we saw that last year, a lot of uh, economies and countries have committed a, a net to a net zero uh, trajectory in terms of their carbon emission. 
Um, so more than 65% of global carbon emitters are now committed, and then um, and that covers 70% uh, of the global economy, and that involves about 110 countries, and that includes uh, the EU and China. So that sends a very strong policy signals to investors and business to align their business plans with its climate goals. And it's an opportunity for business between China and EU to cooperate and work together to set the rules of the transition, be it financial regulation, be it standards for low carbon sectors. So uh, I think there's a lot uh, we can discuss today and I look forward to, to that discussion. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, give the floor now to He Jing Zhang. I hope I have not mispronounced your name. Apologies if I have. Right. Dear all, my name is He Ji Jiang from Tsinghua University, China. One and a half hour ago, a Nordic Energy Transition reporter at the uh, sub, uh, sub forum uh, which I organized was just began. No, Sweden, Swedish reporter is having a presentation for over 30,000 Chinese attending. Uh, this is a uh, 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 this is just one of the 22. Uh, this is a great forum for nine, nine days, including 21 seminars. And uh, yesterday, uh, they are sub forum for France. And the day before yesterday, there is a Finland uh, uh, sub forum. Mm. So, uh, uh, this, this seminar uh, is based on my 15 months long energy transition tour in Europe. And uh, my students and other reporters show how is the energy transition going on in Europe uh, to promote the understanding, the cooperation between China and Europe. Uh, this conference uh, is co-hosted by Tsinghua University and uh, Datong City. It is a local government. Uh, the topic is uh, discuss how the energy company coordinated with city to for peaking carbon emission before 2030 in China, and uh, how to uh, neutrality carbon neutrality before 20. 60. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, and we're, we're interested in hearing about that event. Uh, Fei Shen Zhao, let me give the floor to you and give us your perspective on, on, on why you think today's event is important. Uh, good morning, Jennifer, and good morning, Ambassador Alexander Letao and uh, other distinguished uh, MEP Lydia and also other distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, my name is Fei Sheng Chao. I'm from the Mission of China to the European Union. Uh, I've also been in the diplomatic service for decades, uh, like Ambassador Alexander Letao, and uh, I could see a quite strong Portuguese presence today, and which is a very important event. Uh, I can understand that Portugal is now holding the presidency of the European Union. And just uh, yesterday, I think uh, President Xi Jinping of China just offered his congratulations on the re-election of the Portuguese president. Uh, of course, he also has our best wishes. Uh, I think China and EU has had good cooperation for decades. I believe today's event is also important because climate change is an important topic and it is also one of the most important challenges facing mankind. And no country, uh, not uh, countries as strong as the United States or uh, the European Union, could handle it alone. China is no exception. So to face, this, face up to this common challenge, we need to work together. China places high importance on climate change, and uh, President Xi Jinping also said, that actually to promote a green way of life and a green way of development is going to be a profound revolution in our philosophy towards development. And we have certainly uh, exhibited and made a strong commitment to tackling climate change. This is reflected, I think, in three areas. Number one, that we have made our own national plan since 
2007, we would update our plans and in actions and policies every year. And also, we have also incorporated what we do in tackling climate change in our uh, famous five-year development plans. This is also going to be so in our uh, upcoming 14th five-year plan. Number two, we have actually taken real actions to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, in terms of the carbon emission intensity, China's uh, intensity has actually been reduced uh, by about 48.1% in the year 2019 compared with that of 2005. So we have actually delivered our preset goals uh, ahead of the original schedule. At the same time, we all know that the China heavily depends on coal consumption in terms of our energy supply. But even so, we have actually continuously improved our energy mix. So now the clean energy accounts for about 23.4% of the total energy consumed in China. The hydropower, solar power, and wind power uh, have all registered major growth in China. China has become one of the biggest uh, uh, renewable energy producers in the world today. And uh, you have also noted the fairly rapid growth of the Chinese economy over the decades. What I would like to add here is that uh, China's economy over the past decades uh, has been about 7% on average. But in terms of energy consumption, that growth rate is about 2.8%, which proves to be quite efficient and reflects what China has been doing in improving the economic efficiency and also tackling climate change. Number three, China has been very active in international cooperation to, ta to tackle climate change. Uh, we all know that uh, China is actively involved in the formation of the Copenhagen Accord and also the Paris Agreement itself. And we are also committed to taking an active part in the upcoming COP conference in Glasgow this year. China has also established a, a fund for South-South cooperation to help developing countries to tackle climate change with a total amount of about uh, 20 billion RMB yuan. As the distinguished panelists mentioned just now, towards the end of last year, actually, President Xi Jinping announced that China will strive to peak its carbon emissions by the year 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2060. Of course, I would like to thank our ambassador for inviting China to join the European Union uh, in 2050. I wish that could be true. But of course, we should not so bear in mind the fact that I think the European Union probably peaked its carbon emissions towards the end of the 20th century, last century. And it plans to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, which means that the European Union will take about 50 years between the peaking of carbon emissions and carbon neutrality. While for China, we are going to achieve carbon peak in about 2030 and then achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. We have only set aside about 30 years for our own goal. So it's going to be quite ambitious and a difficult task, but we are serious. So this is the point I would like to make. And for China-EU cooperation, as we also face the common challenge, it's a challenge for the EU, it's a challenge for China. So we have a common objective to tackle climate change. And we already have good communications. And last year, China and the European Union also built a high level dialogue for climate and the environment. Uh, we hopefully the very first meeting of that mechanism will take place this year. And besides, we know that uh, the European Union boasts a lot of sophisticated technology, R&D in environment studies and how to tackle climate change while China has also a quite strong manufacturing base and huge market for environmental products, science, and technologies. So we are complementary. We can do a lot to actually 
make full use of each other's advantages. And number three, that China and the EU could also do a lot to promote global cooperation to help tackle this challenge. These are the three brief points I would like to mention for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. We will be talking about some of those challenges and about some of the different approaches, as well as I want to talk about the different technologies available to help achieve those very ambitious goals that you just mentioned. But first, I'd like to talk about uh, funding. Now, um, Byford raised the issue as well. We need transition funds. There's also recovery funds within the EU, the next generation EU funds. So I would like to hear uh, from the European Council and the European Commission side, um, whether there's an opportunity now with this recovery that we need to do post-pandemic to make it more climate neutral. Um, Elena Badram, let me ask you first to, to reflect on those funding options and why timing is so important at the moment. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And um, uh, it's indeed, a, 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 you know, a hundred billion question, but also more uh, to discuss funding. As we all know, there's, there's this uh, Copenhagen commitment for uh, developed countries collectively to, to mobilize 100 billion US dollars uh, by uh, 2020 to support uh, the low emissions trans transition by our developing country partners. But uh, the 100 billion, in all honesty, is but a drop in the ocean. And I think the Paris Agreement for the first time recognizes that in order for us to make a meaningful difference, it is about making all financial flows uh, consistent with the long-term temperature objectives of the Paris Agreement, i.e. For, for all governments to create the conducive and, um, and uh, enabling environment to facilitate and accelerate the transition to low carbon. I think it's a particular privilege today to, to uh, share the virtual stage uh, with uh, such knowledgeable partners from China. And of course, indeed, as the ambassador was referring, we very much look forward to kicking off the high level energy and climate dialogue, uh, environment and climate dialogue as uh, soon as possible and to look for tangible areas of cooperation in that context. Uh, the International Platform for Sustainable Finance uh, is a very promising platform where we have also engaged with China in order to find um, uh, disclosure, transparency and, and uh, taxonomy methodologies that would allow for screening all public and private finance in view of making it uh, climate compatible. In addition to that, the EU's recovery program, the next generation EU, uh, has a very high climate threshold, uh, a minimum of 30% of not only the recovery program, but also of the EU's multi-annual financial framework will go to directly towards uh, climate purposes. In addition to this, uh, a do no harm principle of what, uh, applies to all EU spending, which means effectively that there will be no further investment into brown or black technologies. And if we look at the IEA statistics and projections, it is very clear that independent of country, independent of region, there will be just no um, room for furthering coal uh, capacity uh, around the world if we mean to stay within the temperature limits that have been stipulated. Um, the EU foreign affairs ministers, uh, in their statement, in their um, conclusions on Monday, which were referred to by the Portuguese colleague and ambassador, um, stipulate that the EU will uh, pursue an immediate stop for unabated coal investments externally. And I think that's a pretty radical uh, decision, which shows that we are very serious about um, powering, about moving beyond coal-based economy and energy mix. We have welcomed, of course, uh, President Xi Jinping's announcement from September from the UNF, uh, UN uh, General Assembly to China to reach um, their net zero emissions goal by 2060. At the same time, we really do want to urge China uh, to take advantage of the available technologies that we did not have 20 years ago and rapidly accelerate their transition in view of uh, uh, peaking 
uh, no later than 2025, because we think that that's in the interest of all of us in order to facilitate this faster transition to a new low carbon economy, which inevitably will be determining the market marketplace and, and the different product mix that we will be dealing with. It's um, a, a humongous task, financial flows, but also international cooperation and leading by example is something that the EU looks forward to embarking in these very exceptional and positive political conditions that we see today with the new US administration having rejoined the Paris Agreement um, and having, uh, you know, really stipulated how keen they are to enter to the international leadership space together with EU and China. And I very much look forward to us taking ambition to next level before Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. We are focused today on EU and China, but it is a global issue indeed. So um, the US rejoining the Paris Agreement is something that will presumably have a massive effect. But you mentioned there the Portuguese presidency position. So perhaps, uh, Alexandra, you could uh, build on that for us. Well, um, thank you, Jennifer. I, um, yes, I, I fully uh, follow what Ms. Badam said now, uh, the, the point, but I would also, also would like to add some, um, some things. Of course, we, I think we are all familiar with uh, the new in financial instruments within the European Union to, to build recovery on a double transition, green and digital, and make some sort of triangle between digital, uh, green, and fair transition, because uh, one, one thing is clear. Uh, new technologies, new transition cannot lead to a situation where people are left behind, where the transition is unfair. This will be the worst message we can pass to the world and to all those who are still not in this ship, uh, let's say so, as we are. And so there is also a role, very important role here, to um, cooperation for development that our colleague from China s spoke about. It is really essential to, to be uh, aware, to raise awareness in, in developing countries, aware of the nexus between climate and security, between the, uh, between the consequences, the climate and its consequences. We need to raise awareness on mitigation, adaptation. We need to understand, for instance, that uh, people with a poor education are less able to understand complex concepts, that people who are fighting for survival will, of course, fight for survival first, and then they will think about other concepts. So all this must be uh, we must promote people's awareness of climate change through education, and this is decisive for agenda setting. Uh, we, of course, need to implement, agree, and implement quickly the new ACP European Union Agreement and the new NDC, NDICI, to improve our support to partner countries, which in such a way that our uh, development cooperation becomes more effective. And then there is another issue that has been uh, focused, that is the, the climate finance. Uh, the European Investment Bank is, uh, I think, also leading by example. But many in international financial institutions are not following the same example. It is very important that they do so. Um, we hope that the spring uh, weeks of the World Bank and the IMF will allow us to, um, to accelerate our mutual efforts. And of course, we expect Asian Development Bank and the AIIB to do so. Finally, two points that have been raised. Of course, the role of the US is key. Uh, last Friday, our ministers of foreign affairs had the first chance, I think it was the first international appearance, although informal, of Mr. John Kerry, the new special envoy for climate and energy. He spoke during one hour and a half with our ministers and also with Commissioner uh, Timmermans and the High Representative and Vice President Borrell. Uh, this was a very interesting debate where all countries uh, managed to put their concerns over the table, and we heard 
clearly from Mr. Kerry that something has really changed in the US. So we really hope that the US will soon present this NDC uh, in order to uh, go together, also with China, of course, to Glasgow and to have in Glasgow a COP that will be really a changing moment, uh, going from words to action, as we expect it to happen in the Biodiversity uh, Summit uh, in China or at the second UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. We need to use these moments to go from words to action, leveraging specific and effective measures. The last point I would like to say is that uh, is to just to point here the essential role too of India. Uh, in May, we will have a summit. I think it will be the first occasion when all the new leaders will meet the Prime Minister Modi in Porto. And this is, of course, another decisive moment to uh, our uh, ambition, because India is also a very big and populated country, a growing, fast-growing economy. And as I said at the beginning, we really need to have these big countries like China, India, Russia, Brazil, Indonesia on board. It's essential for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, pointing out indeed that this is more than just an EU China matter. Of course it is. But let me turn now um, as as an economist, uh, Edmond. Could I ask you to react to what we've heard from our EU institution colleagues? To to uh, put the the focus on, on something uh, which, uh, in my view, is uh, very important uh, when it comes to. Uh, financing project for near this transition. Uh, you ha we have to keep in mind that there is a huge amount of savings in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world today. There is some economists pretend even that there is excess saving. And the price uh, of uh, the, the cost of money, the, the, cost, the, the, the rate of interest is very low. So the funding of the energy transition is not, is not, in my opinion, the main issue. The main issue is to have an incentive to shift the project for, um, for the creation of energy from fossil oil to, uh, in a, to, to uh, carbon free uh, projects. And, uh, and you need an incentive for that an incentive which works uh, on the market. And this incentive is the price of carbon. And if you, if you develop the price of carbon um, over the world with a significant price of carbon, then there will be a very big incentive for all the investors to go towards uh, projects which do not emit, or at least emit less, and or do not emit carbon. And this is, a major, major issue. The, the problem is less on the supply of the funds, which are available. There is a lot, a lot of, 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 of money in the world, a lot, a lot of money. The problem is the incentive so that the demand for clean projects for the energy transition is uh, high enough. And this comes, in my opinion, through the best catalyst we have, which is the price of carbon. Thank you. We will dwell more, I think, on those issues. But first, I'd like to backtrack a little bit. Um, Byford, you mentioned that you speak a lot to civil society. Explain to me why that is important. Yeah, so, um, I mean, yeah, so the, the, what we have been doing is that we want to facilitate some conversations uh, around what EU and China, and, and obviously also now US coming back because of the new uh, presidency. Like we also want to have that conversation with our US counterparts in terms of thinking about uh, what are the opportunities uh, for EU, China, and the US to to cooperate um, in terms of climate change, and and also managing some of the the more contentious elements and how do we 
um, you know, intervene more early to, to create a more constructive environment for a conversation. So I think that in itself is, is very important. Um, and then secondly, I think what was important uh, from the, the point of view of civil society is that, um, so in, in the political level, there, obviously there has been a lot, a lot of engagement, but I think what, what is needed is for us to think through what are the the actual issues uh, embedded in, in in the questions like they like say for for carbon pricing um um so now there is a, a new uh, proposal by by the eu and also in the us to to introduce uh, some carbon tariffs that may affect uh, other countries that included the us so so um i think our role as a society is to think about how how that is um that would that would be um, an implementable policy and how to make it implementable. So I think that's that's very important. Thank you, Lydia. Let me ask you a little bit about whether what can be done by policymakers and, and how much do we need to bring in wider society? How much do we need to put the emphasis on technologies, on companies, on providers? Talk to me a little bit about the, the nexus of all the different stakeholders that are involved. Well, I think if we don't have the stakeholders involved, if we don't have the civil society, if we don't have both public and private sector, we won't drive any change. And so everyone has to feel and has to be um, uh, part of the, of the several uh, initiatives that are um, being uh, enacted by policymakers and uh, together with, with the private sector. But I would like to um, go a, a little bit um, uh, back uh, to uh, something that I think it's important for uh, for the discussion because we are talking about the EU and China cooperation uh, and I think um, that uh, it is important to refer that uh, when in 2017 we saw the United States abandoning the Paris Agreement um, because uh, the, pr the previous administration considered that the economic consequences of adapting the uh, adapting the economy the society and fighting climate change um, would lose its ability to be kept competitive. Uh, so I think in this situation, uh, actually, uh, given that this is a global problem, uh, China did not uh, follow the same path as the uh, United States. Uh, and so I think it was here, it is a positive sign on uh, the ability and the willingness to, to be cooperating. Um, but finally, and hopefully, uh, the... Um, the US has pledged uh, to re-enter the Paris Agreement, and I think it is very crucial to compromise, um, to have a, a wide compromise of the largest economies in the world uh, to uh, effectively uh, drive change. Uh, now, I would also like to mention um, that um, many people have the idea that China has a, a bad environmental record. Um, it is true that China has a very large uh, carbon footprint, uh, no one can deny it. Uh, data cannot uh, cannot fake it. Uh, but still, China is the most populated country uh, in the world and uh, one of the largest economies, uh, the second so far. And uh, so there is a lot of uh, work ahead to reduce this uh, carbon footprint. Uh, but uh, I think the significant infrastructure investment that China is and has been doing abroad uh, whether that is Chinese uh, financed infrastructure uh, is high carbon or low carbon, will have a profound, a very a deep impact in the future of fossil fuel based economies and in the global warming. And if countries that have signed uh, on uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative develop their infrastructure on a business as usual path, by 2050, they will account of, for two thirds of global emissions. And I think it is important that we look back and see the changes that have already been made. I mean, without coal, uh, probably there, would not, there wouldn't be um, any industrial revolution, uh, but we, we need to move swiftly from coal and, and, and even gas. So uh, this is not uh, my, my understanding of, of, of this problem is that this is not America against Europe against China. This is not uh, a, an economic conflict or nor a conflict for the control of some parts of the globe. I think we are in this fight. Um, we, we can only win together or we will lose together. 
Thank you very much. Now, I am keeping an eye on our questions that are coming in from our audience today, as well as also watching on Twitter. You can join the conversation online using the hashtag EA Debate. So we'd very much like to hear the views and questions of those watching. If you have got a question, please indicate which of our panelists it's for and indeed uh, try to keep it succinct. We will get through as many of those as we can. So I'm going to actually, I would like to, to next uh, speak to He Zhijiang, um, and I'm going to take a question from uh, one of our audience members, which is, will cooperation trump competition regarding new technologies? And how will intelligence and security relations adapt? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, reflect on the technology part, um, because I know that China is leading in many of these photovoltaic areas and in many of the other renewable areas. Okay, okay. First, uh, I want to report a greater new, greater good news to you. Photovoltaic system in China are already available for around uh, only 400 euros per kilowatt. No, more than 70% of global PV model are currently produced in China. The price of the photovoltaic in, in Europe is much more expensive than this. An important reason is that the installation cost in Europe is very high. Uh, the cheap PV model supplied by China uh, Uh, will directly reduce the cost of the PV power generation in Europe and uh, enable most uh, Europe countries to achieve photovoltaic parity on the grid. This greatly reduces the amount of the government to public subsidy and uh, also helps to create more value for the people. At the same time, it also promotes Europe photovoltaic installation and produce more zero carbon solar electricity for Europe. Uh, today, uh, today, I would uh, like to extend an invitation to my friends uh, in the Euro Euro uh, Europe to have a race between Europe and China to see how can we more ahead to cope uh, who can be more ahead to reach the global of the one PV, one kilowatt PV per capita? Uh, no, Germany uh, rank first in the EU, which more than uh, over 600 watt of PV uh, electricity per capita. China's PV development is following the uh, footstep of, the China, of the Germany. At uh, present, uh, China's per capita installed uh, ca capacity of the PV power is about uh, 160 uh, watt. We need to speak, speed up to narrow the gap between Germany. Germany's plan is to achieve 1.2 kilowatt of the PV power generation per capita uh, in 2030. It is possible that China will achieve one kilowatt PV installed uh, capacity per capita in 2030, uh, maybe perhaps uh, earlier than this time. This per capita PV capacity of the other EU countries is less than that of the Germany. We welcome EU countries to join this uh, competition. Therefore, we hope to stimulator and uh, accelerator the process of developing PV clean energy in China and the EU through such a friendly competition. Uh, it is a risk, a friendly risk. Uh, welcome. Thank you okay. very much indeed. Byford, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, so I think, yeah, on the question about kind of competitive and the kind of uh, cooperation dynamics uh, on, on energy specifically. So I think, I mean, the, the, as the way things stand is, is obviously China is a, a huge manufacturer of a lot of the renewable technology. So 
uh, three quarters of the world's solar panels is manufactured in China. Over 70% of the lithium battery that goes into your cell phones and also electric cars is also manufactured in China. So there's no doubt that um, like the world would have to, when they think about supply chains of those technologies, they would have to turn to China. But it doesn't mean that like it's, 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 um, it's competitive dynamics between um, the other countries in China. What's most important is that, as I said earlier, like for the European uh, Green Deal objectives to, to, to be achieved, like you would have to work with partners, including China, to, to, um, to make sure the supply chain are resilient uh, and open. So I think that's very important. And the way to do that, um, there are two ways. The first one is obviously for the EU and the China to agree on a set of standards um, that would govern the development of these technologies, such as emerging technologies like green hydrogen, but also on batteries, um, to agree on such principles so that they can uh, compete or cooperate uh, constructively um, so that there's a race to the top, not the race to the bottom. And secondly, um, so in the recent um, EU-US discussion, so the EU actually raised a, a new a climate and trade uh, initiative um, and, and they, they both want to drive some reforms in the WTO to align uh, trade with climate, so to ensure that um, trade of low carbon technologies would would keep uh, would be kept uh, in, in increasingly with perhaps more turbulent uh, dynamics but uh, I think that that's something that uh, also China could think about in, including in in their policy priorities thinking about how do we reform together with the EU and others um, a global trade system that is aligned with um, the objectives of a low carbon world Thank you very much. Now, Alina, I know you have something to add, but first I want to uh, go to Fei Sheng Chao because it's not just about electricity, is it? It's, it's, it's broader than that. So I'm going to ask another question that has come in from our audience. Um, so how will the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism play out in EU-China relations and how is the CBAM perceived in China? So you are mentioning a question about the, the carbon tax on the border? Yes. Yes, okay. I think this is a, a very topical question in the European Union. And also, uh, given EU's trading ties with many of the other major countries in the world, it has also attracted attention from places elsewhere, uh, including China, the United States, and many other of EU's trading partners. I think this is a very important issue that would certainly require more careful study by scientists, by economists, and by different national authorities around the world. And of course, I agree with what uh, Edmund said just now, that probably money is not the problem, yeah, because we have a huge flux of money in today's world. Let's take a look at the Wall Street several days ago. But the real issue is the incentives. So we need to locate what are the incentives and also how these incentives should work. And probably according to the Green Deal of the European Union, the carbon border tax is one of the incentives that the EU is considering. I think so we need to take a closer look at this particular incentive that the EU is planning to adopt and also to see, take a closer look at the what the implications will be. Will it be good for the environment? Will it be good for the normal trading ties among different nations? And that takes time and certainly that takes more consultation and discussion among the, all the major stakeholders. Um, now, Alina, I know you wanted to come back to an earlier point, so uh, the floor is yours. Which, which issue were you going to raise next? Well, thanks, Jennifer. I think I'll, I'll try and tackle a couple of things that have come up and that are very, very pertinent and also relate directly to the EU-China and EU international relations at large. Uh, with the European Green Deal, deal we have, of course, put the uh, climate agenda, net zero transition into the very epicenter 
of European foreign policy and all our policy instruments will be aligned to support our objective in this regard. That includes trade policy instruments, um, it includes um, our development cooperation instruments and different types of strategic um, partnerships and alliances. The Green Tech Alliance uh, that was previously referred to and is stipulated as an area of cooperation between US and EU as we move on is indeed a, a, a concept that we'd be interested to explore and pursue with other partners because um, as was said by the honorable member of the parliament um, it is not about competition uh, it should be about sparring partners moving together in a positive spirit towards the same goal. Paris Agreement is the first ever universal agreement on climate change and, and it reflects the contemporary world order where the technologies that we today have available uh, are very different from 10 or, or 20 years ago and we should embrace the opportunity, the wave uh, that we now are able to ride in order to fast uh, move to that net zero reality. In that context, I'd really like to acknowledge and um, welcome the efforts of the Chinese Environment Ministry who have been thinking uh, about an idea of, of banning all coal power investment overseas. And I think this shows a, a very welcome shift in philosophy, which is also reflected by the way, if you look at financial times from yesterday, where we have a bit of an analysis of the belt and road investment, saying that, that um, up to 57% of the total of belt and road investment uh, goes to wind, solar and hydro. And, and I think that's a positive development. Of course, it needs to be accelerated because the decisions we make on infrastructure and energy supply today will bear relevance to the next uh, 30 to 50 years. So, so there's, a, there's a huge responsibility on today's generation to spend the monies wisely um, in the modern way uh, to invest into technologies of future, not into the technologies of the past. And we really uh, look forward to cooperating on that. As what comes to the uh, border measure that has been uh, mentioned um, in the European Green Deal, it is indeed a policy measure that we would be introducing uh, in the case that differences on the level of ambition between international partners persist. Obviously, we we will use all positive avenues, uh, our climate diplomacy, to avoid a situation where, where abruptive measures would somehow come as a surprise to our partners. But this is not a uh, new measure. And I can just assure you that we have our best lawyers, best technicians and best economists on track to ensure that whatever is introduced, put forward as a proposal by the Commission, will be fully uh, WTO compatible, it will be non-discriminatory and will be um, fair and balanced uh, and technically sound. Uh, we will be of course consulting our partners, uh, informing them about the plans in due course but at the moment our internal analysis is still ongoing and it's too early to talk about specific options in this respect. Um, I will maybe stop there just to say that the policy intent of a border measure is, is not a protectionist measure. It is to avoid leakage of CO2 emissions, uh, somehow relocation of EU industry in other parts of the world where the impact, overall impact on environment would be a very negative one. So it is an environmental measure indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, Edmond, I know you want to come in. Uh, I think I've seen you reacting to many of your fellow panelists. Um, perhaps you could tell us a, a little bit more um, about, about these issues before I come back to some questions from our audience. Uh, I, I want to react to the excellent, excellent observation of uh, Sheng Chao, uh, which I share. Uh, I'm not fond myself of uh, tax on the borders, on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. I'm not fond at all. Uh, you said that we need an incentive. I should say that we need uh, an incentive with a level playing field, which would avoid a tax on the borders. And this incentive is a price of carbon worldwide. That's a dream. I, and I know that's the dream, but it could be discussed at least during the COP26. And anyhow, I think that if the three main blocks, which are the main emitters in the world, the EU, 
the US and China had an, agree an agreement together to push towards a convergent price of carbon between the three blocks significantly, then we would avoid any initiatives such as the uh, tax on the borders, which uh, would harm many countries. And I think that it is the objective we should have in mind, because it is the best way to decarbonize the planet. And if the three blocks take this orientation, I'm sure that the rest of the world will follow suit. Thank you, Edmond. Uh, Fei Sheng Chao, I want to get as well as your reaction. I'm also going to bring in a question from one of our audience members, from Julia Bedini from MLEX, who's asked, is there an appetite for linking the forthcoming Chinese ETS with the EU's one? Uh, yes, I think uh, I understand your question. I think that the, the European Union has actually taken the lead in many of the measures to actually create the incentives and to promote the carbon markets. And China, through its decades of cooperation with the, uh, with the European Union, uh, have actually drawn upon the European experience to a large extent. So we are also developing our own carbon trading mechanism and also carbon markets. It's not only a national effort in China, but also I understand in different provinces and localities, they are introducing their specific plans and pilot programs to promote this initiative. And so I think this is a very good sign and uh, it also bodes well for further cooperation and exchanges between China and the European Union. And I would also like to react to some of the points mentioned by the panelists just now. And uh, number one, that uh, I, I don't think that uh, climate change is a issue or challenge of just one dimension. It's a multi-dimensional challenge, which means that we also need to take multi-dimensional efforts. If we only focus on reducing commission, then probably it will not work. That's why we need to bring in and factor in different factors like finance, as we mentioned just now. And in terms of finance, uh, I said I agreed with Edmund, what Edmund said just now, money is not the problem, the incentive is. And finance has a key role to play in this area. Uh, and also I agree with uh, what uh, Lydia just now, uh, what uh, actually Elena just said now, that uh, probably that uh, 100 billion euros or US dollars could be seen as just a drop in the ocean. We certainly need more money. But the real problem is how to mobilize the money to support this course. And so China is also taking actions. Uh, we all know about the issuance of green bonds. Uh, according to statistics of 2018, China is among the three major issuers of green bonds with about, I think, uh, 30 billion US dollars in 2018. 18, uh, only after the United States at that time. And I understand that the France uh, was the third largest issuer of the green bonds. So this is a very, uh, also uh, an area where we have good potentials to cooperate further. And also mentioning China's track record in environment, I think uh, probably there is a, a huge misunderstanding of what China has been doing in this area as well. Uh, we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of negative coverage about China uh, in this part of the world, I would say. Uh, uh, today, I, I just do not want to defend China in any way, but I think I just want to mention the fact that uh, in China, we have a saying that probably you'll get to see the true picture if you listen to both sides or even more than two sides. So facts and the truth speak louder. We need to take a look at the fact. As I mentioned, the China's economy has been growing at about 7%, while the energy consumption is just about 2.8% per year. And another fact is just now, there's no denial. Now we probably have the largest emission in the world. But let us not forget, we have the largest population in the world. And we have also lifted 
the largest group of people out of poverty of the past four decades in billions. So that's a major achievement. But now we can see that the China's GDP per capita just exceeded 10,000 US dollars last year. Mm -hmm. That's about, I would say, one fifth or one sixth of that of the United States. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the household electricity consumption, ours is only about one seventh or one eighth of that of the United States. So you could see that uh, what China has been doing, improving the energy efficiency in that part of the world with that huge population. And I would say that's a huge contribution to humanity as well. And we all know that in Paris Agreement, we set goals not only for the long term, like 2030, 2060, but also set immediate term goals. And some of the goals need to be achieved by the end of the year 2020. China well delivered its goals promised years earlier. So I would say China has a quite strong record and is a trustworthy country in this area. But of course, we need more cooperation, like what uh, uh, Elena just said, that today probably we have more advanced technologies and we have more best practices elsewhere. We need to consult more, communicate more and cooperate more so that we will have better means to help all of us achieve our goal and to tackle the common challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you said it quite well. There is usually more than two sides to every story. And in this, there are many, many, many different uh, angles that we could approach from. Um, but I would like now, we have a question that has come in from our audience, specifically for Alexandre. Um, the question there that has been sent in by Jamie is, which is the role of technological cooperation? And do you have any key examples um, in terms of how technology can lift us into climate neutrality? Um, thank you very much. Well, that's a very interesting question. And um, it's obvious that the role is absolutely obvious and, and key. I mean, this is probably how we are going to manage this question because I would uh, I would comment on uh, how Mr. Chen Shao just said that now when he said that facts uh, speak louder and I would bring on board something that is that has not been very much mentioned that is the private sector we believe very much in the role of private sector I mean if the green or the blue economy becomes economically rational and obvious to uh, to the, the to businessmen. Uh, this will happen almost spontaneously with time, uh, and we really don't need strong regulation or whatever. It will just happen. So, how that can this happen? We saw that there is there is capital. It's clear that there is capital. One thing is saying that international financing institutions could be doing more in order to align their uh, policies with the Paris Agreement and our ambition. Another thing is to say that there is no money. There is money. If there are good projects, there, are, there is money. And so the second point is that energy is absolutely essential in this process. Energy is a big part of this process. Uh, one thing is clear uh, for a fair transition, for addressing the fear of uh, competition, the fear of losing jobs, the fear of being left behind. Um, new renewable energies cannot be cannot mean higher tariffs for consumers, for companies, etc. So technology is absolutely essential. I will give you. Uh, two or three examples because it was asked. Uh, one of them is, I will take my country. Um, Portugal is a country where tourism is very important, but we are not in the center of Europe. Um, for our touristic product, we need to bring people by plane. It's like that. It's a reality. We are not in the center, so we need to bring people on plane. But by planes have um, a true footprint, a big footprint, like many transports. So, 
the key is obviously to work on technology. Technology can make planes lighter, can make energies less, can make engines less energy consuming, and uh, may um, allow energies to be more cost efficient. We need cheap renewable energy. That's why, for instance, we are also betting a lot on uh, green hydrogen. I would say that um, a country like Portugal doesn't have oil or gas and uh, has committed very ambitiously to these goals. For instance, we were, I think, the first to commit with the 2050 target at the Marrakesh Summit in, 12, in 2016. Um, we have now, uh, we have committed to less 55% of emissions by 2013, 80% of renewables in energy, 35% uh, of energy efficiency, and we want to have hydrogen, green hydrogen. We believe that hydrogen, green hydrogen can be the high intensity energy that we need because Portugal does not use nuclear, for instance, and at um, a competitive cost. Uh, and in another dimension, um, R&D cooperation is already happening, I think, in a global network. China is very active on this, and I believe we can improve this cooperation. This is really, if there is a global dimension that can leverage our collective effort and help us bringing the targets to 2050, it's really R&D and technology. And one final word to Mr. Cheng Chao, just to say, I fully understand your points about the context of China and what uh, how, how impressive your effort is uh, effectively. But the point is that um, when we see Glasgow approaching, we see that many, there are three categories of countries. There are those who are committing to 2050, those who are committing to 2060, and the others who haven't decided yet. And uh, China is one of the three big players currently. In the near future, there will be more, but now it's US, China, European Union. If we could work together with joint targets, it would be easier to bring all on board to our common ambition. If we divide ourselves between two different ambitions, there is um, a polarization of the situation. Uh, that was just my point. It's the, 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 the great leverage effect that any uh, policy that China adopts is provoking right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lydia, I want to come to you next. Now, we have a range of questions coming in from our audience, touching on everything from the EV sector to thermal energy to the steel sector, and even in terms of transport. Um, so I'm not going to force you to answer any one in particular, but perhaps you could take a look at some of these questions. Where do China and the EU see the most focus in terms of transport between green electric, hydrogen, biofuels or other? Um, as, as we've seen, there are so many different areas that, uh, that could be touched on. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts and your reactions to, uh, to what everyone here is saying, as well as picking out maybe a specific sector where you think is, is particularly pertinent. I think there are two uh, important uh, or most uh, or, or main points uh, in relation to uh, transportation. And I think it is uh, how our mobility, how uh, we um, uh, how we 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 see the transports at the moment in cities and the importance of cities um, as drivers of changes in in the way we commute. Uh, and also, there's of course the aviation sector. Um, I think the the this pandemic um, has completely. Uh, Frozen the the the, um, the the international travels through uh, in the in the international in in the aviation. So the aviation aviation sector is having a, a very tough time. Um, but I think it is it's it's also a, an opportunity to actually take the time to assess where the aviation sector can be or can become more uh, efficient. Uh, I think it, it's only possible if there's um, su significant developments in uh, in the in research in innovation uh, that uh, can go towards this 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 objective. 
but I think this pandemic is going to reveal some changes in the in the international uh, travel uh, because the the fact that we we can actually do a lot of work uh, without leaving our own uh, home offices or uh, uh, from the office. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the industry will adapt um, and how on the other side uh, innovation will um, be potentially in the forefront uh, to uh, overcome this uh, economic recovery that we, we, we very much need. Then when we come to cities, I think it's, it's important and, um, to uh, witness the changes that we are already uh, seeing uh, in, in cities. Um, there's a lot of, um, particularly, for example, I can I can speak about my um, in my experience in in Portugal. We are finally see witnessing a, a change for more uh, collective uh, transportation rather than individual uh, uh, cars, uh, and also the use of uh, more and more um, um, transports like uh, bicycle or some, or or this or related um, related um, um, uh, related transports of these uh, mobility schemes. So there's a lot of uh, innovative innovative solutions which are related to uh, car sharing, for example. Uh, and so we see in the society people uh, want to also change because there's a lot of uh, um, economy savings. Uh, in shifting to these, uh, adopting these more efficient, greener um, means of, of transport. So I think um, I would identify, I identify these two uh, sectors as the most important ones, and I would like to highlight the uh, relevant uh, uh, role that uh, cities will play uh, in terms of, uh, of mobility and also uh, the, the economy, the internet of things that will uh, continue to promote and and um, and make available um, a number of solutions, uh, so we can we can commute uh, in a greener, safer, and um, more efficient ways. Thank you very much, um, Fei Sangjua. I think you had uh, something you wanted to add to her points. China-EU cooperation and also about the prospect for the upcoming COP meeting in Glasgow. And I very much agree with you that all of us, all the major stakeholders, China, EU and other parts, partners, all need to send the same message and the strong political message. And uh, that's also why when President Xi announced China's newly released goals of peaking carbon emissions in 2030, and uh, achieving carbon neutrality by the year 2060, that message was very well received in the international community. And in that regard, I think China, together with its international partners, including the European Union, already did succeed in sending a strong international commitment. So now the real problem is not that uh, we do not have exactly the same goals in that particular regard. The real problem is uh, what will bring me back to the points mentioned by just now the other distinguished panelist, uh, Bai Fu Zhang, that political commitment is important. But what is more important is to translate the political commitment into real actions and to translate the real actions into real results. That means a lot. And that will actually, at the end of the day, determine whether we could succeed or not. So that's the point I, I would like to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, Jing Zhang, I think I saw you raise your hand there as well to make a comment. Yeah, another good, uh, good news. In China, about the EV, uh, you, you can pay only 20,000 euro you can get a UA. Uh, it can drive over 300 kilometers. It's a chip, it's a chip. Uh, if uh, uh, more German, uh, more European uh, have this uh, UA, uh, this is uh, very uh, good uh, news. And uh, uh, 17, uh, 13, 13 months ago, uh, 
uh, about the Christmas of the 19, uh, 2019, I rent a UV uh, and uh, have a travel in Germany. In Germany, uh, but I noticed uh, in Germany the charge station is uh, less than China, and uh, is uh, uh, slow. slow and slow. The charging is uh, slow. Uh, so uh, in this charge station, China is a uh, uh, ahead of the uh, Germany. Uh, maybe I think there are good uh, cooperation uh, between China and. Uh, uh, EU in EV and uh, charge station. Yeah. And uh, I have another suggestion. Uh, because uh, because uh, the eva evaluation of carbon neutrality need a uh, mu mutuality, ag mutuality agreed uh, MRV system. So I think we should pay more attention to the green standard. Uh, the series of green a criteria will encompass standard for pro product uh, produced product uh, carbon footprints, carbon market, energy efficiency building, green finance standard, and so on. Last year, the most important task I'm promoting in Europe is to working with Europe, uh, European institution, institution to establish a net ecological benefit standard for PV power plant. There are many PV plant in China that have been built on desert area and have a significant ecological restoration effort, resulting in an improvement in vegetation recovery in desert area. In Germany, the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy has conducted research and a pilot uh, project on the integration of agriculture and the PV, realizing the composite use of the farmland and uh, improving the land value of the farmland. In this land, the concept of the net uh, ecological benefit has also been introduced in the design of the photovoltaic PV plant built on agriculture land. We are consolidating the experience and the practice from these different regions to develop a crit criteria for the net ecological benefit of PV power plant throughout their life cycle. Uh, this work also in under the guidance and the coordination of the United Nations Convention to Combat Justification. The standard will account not only for the carbon footprint of the PV power plant, but also for the ecological benefit of the PV plant on land restoration, soil or organic carbon, and uh, biodiversity. Uh, as the uh, establishment of this PV plant net ecological benefit standard could uh, lead the global PV, PV manufacturing industry uh, and the PV plant construction industry toward a lower and even negative carbon emission. In addition, this set of the net ecological efficiency standards for PV power plant jointly developed by China and Europe should actively serve the food world. If the standard were adopted to guide the construction of PV power plant in Africa, it would not only develop carbon-free electricity, but also help combat, combat desertification and uh, increase employment in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've answered quite a lot of those different sectoral questions, of course, touching on electronic vehicles and so on. Now, I'm aware that uh, our two representatives from the Commission and the Parliament need to leave shortly. So, Alina, let me ask for your wrap-up thoughts, um, and then, Lydia, I'll come to you, to, 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 as you have to leave at 11, and then, by for it on the rest, we will, we will continue on for another 15 minutes. So, Alina, the floor is yours. 
Thanks very much, Jennifer. And, and it's been a real pleasure to, to join you in this positive spirit and, uh, and talk about issues on which we seem to very uh, much and broadly align. Uh, of course, facts, action, science uh, and transparency matter. So very much uh, support uh, Professor Hess's uh, uh, comments earlier. I also think that um, what Councillor Fay was saying about uh, action uh, is really key. In that context, we look forward to seeing the 14th five-year plan from China in early March and, and expect that that will put forward a very ambitious cap for the national ETS as part of it. Um, we will be ready to, to continue our cooperation on carbon pricing on the markets in order to sh see how we can best align. I think at the end of the day, what I would conclude as a takeaway from here is that there's lots of space and willingness for international cooperation, but it is clear that we all need to do more. Um, in 2019, um, the US per capita emissions uh, of CO2 stood at 16 tons. China's per capita emissions were at eight tons per capita. And for the EU, the respective figure was six. For all of us, that is too much. So efforts must be scaled up. They must be decisively um, uh, put forward in as part of our national planning and strategies. And I hope that together uh, we will reach an ambitious target before COP26. I'll conclude there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and we very much appreciate you taking the time this morning to talk to us. Uh, Lydia, let me turn to you, as I know you've got some wrapping up closing remarks before we let you go. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, I would just like to um, also add to uh, the, the previous question in relation to transportation and mobility. Um, I think there's a, an important topic here as well, which is uh, related to the materials uh, for uh, that we will need for for example, solar panels and uh, and uh, batteries, um, there will be um, an increasing um, number of, of disputes for, for new resources. And so I think um, this is uh, sensitive because uh, we don't want to, uh, to, to start uh, other fights uh, for the resources that we will have to share and that we know are, are very limited. Uh, so I'm referring in particular, um, for example, uh, cobalt, lithium, and uh, and other rare um, uh, mi minerals um, that uh, we will that countries will be forced to scramble to for for control over specific geographies, and this is something uh, that we should uh, take into consideration uh, because uh, we want to keep uh, uh, driving the world uh, into a more greener. Um, uh, framework than we know at the moment, but also in a peaceful way. And I think this is uh, relevant for the several challenges we have ahead that we should not forget. Thank you for the invitation once again. Thank you very much, ladies. Uh, we, we appreciate your time this morning uh, in, in joining us and giving us your thoughts. Um, so we will let you go. Byford, you were going to join in, I think, earlier. You had a comment to make uh, on one of our previous points. Yeah, so I think I just want to add on what uh, Mr. Fay was, was, was alluding to uh, earlier about the fact that the, the importance of both the polit political commitment and climate action uh, this year. So I think this year is a very important year because we have the Glasgow Summit towards the end of the year and it's a high profile climate summit. Um, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for countries to demonstrate that uh, they're serious about tackling climate change um, and they are having political commitments being backed up by short and medium term policies. Um, so, um, and it is, it's, it's not, well, not only important because of the climate change issue itself, it's also because um, at a time where the world is still, you know, uh, in, in, in COVID and, and in lockdown, it's very important to also show the world that uh, climate action is possible, but also rebuild trust in the multilateral system, which has been, uh, you know, undermined by well, not only the COVID pandemic, but also because of what the uh, the previous American president have done to the international system. So I think climate change provides us with an opportunity to demonstrate that the the global system, the multilateralism, is still alive, and I'm sure that EU and China together can can do that um, by 
bring, bringing uh, political commitment, which they have done, but also implementing uh, short, medium term climate policies, which they, I'm sure they would do for the EU through the implementation of the EU next generation funds and for China through uh, flashing the policies objectives out in the 14 5 year plan. Thank you very much for that. Um, we had a question come in uh, from uh, one of our viewers from uh, Chinese media um, and asking again about that national emissions trading system uh, due to be launched on February the 1st. Um, what are the expectations, um, uh, Sheng Zhao? What do you expect to, to, I mean, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, I know we've touched on it a lot already. <laughs> Yes, I think, uh, as we mentioned just now, that uh, in September last year, President Xi Jinping of China announced uh, China's goal of peak carbon emissions by the year 2030 and then achieving carbon neutrality by 2060. The international community has welcomed this message. At the same time, a lot of questions have been raised about how China is going to deliver. So I think we need to put this issue in this perspective that there is a lot, as I mentioned, this is a multi-dimensional challenge. There is a lot that we all need to do more and we all to, uh, need to do it together. So I think the introduction of the ETS in China is one of the things we are doing and we are planning to do. So as I mentioned, it's not only a national effort, it's also an effort, a national effort with specific breakdowns in different localities and the provinces. And we have drawn a lot from the European experience in this regard, to be very honest with you. And certainly I believe that it will serve everybody's interest to help China uh, better introduce and better operate the system. And uh, we do not expect a smooth sell with just the single launch of the ETS, but we hope with international cooperation and with our own hard effort, we can continue to make good and solid progress step by step towards our shared goal of tackling climate change. Thank you. And a follow-up question, if I may. Um, will China be putting in place a similar or, or equal or equivalent carbon price to the EU? Uh, I, I would not uh, presume that uh, what may happen in the future. But I would like to say that China uh, actually promotes the idea of a open world economy and international cooperation in tackling challenge, common challenges for humanity and climate change exactly falls into this category. So I would not rule out any possibility in any particular regard, but I would say that it's better we see and cooperate with each other to help achieve the same goal and deliver what we have promised, respectively. Thank you for that. Edmund, uh, I'm going to give the floor to you now as you've got a comment to make, but I'd also, we've got about 10 minutes left, but also ask you to give your sort of wrap up and closing thoughts and expectations. Okay, uh, great. Uh, Shang Shao, I, I, I fully agree with what you said. and. Uh, it's uh, very encouraging for the future, what you said about uh, the policy in China and, uh, and the use of market on carbon. Let me, let me put a figure, a figure on the challenge ahead, because people have to understand the huge challenge in terms of uh, figures. Actually, according to the International Energy Agency, in, globally in the world, emission of carbon is about 33 billion tons every year. Every year. There is a technique to absorb uh, the carbon out of the, of the atmosphere and bury it. It is called the CCS technique, carbon capture and storage. It exists, it exists in China, by the way, and uh, at a small level, but it exists. It exists in many countries, but it doesn't expand. Why? Because it's cost. It's just the cost very, very much. But let us take uh, the cost uh, 
of many, many firms like Total in France, 100 euro per ton. Assume that we decide to stop the increase, the increase in uh, 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 the emission of carbon every year. The cost would be 33 billion multiplied by 100. That makes 3.3 trillion euro per year. Per year. This is more than the wealth created by a country like Germany every year. Every year. GDP of Germany is lower than this level. So the huge challenge we have, not to go to, um, uh, I should say, uh, the uh, 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 carbon uh, neutrality, but just to stop the increase every year of carbon is this level, to mobilize. The fund to mobilize is huge. And how to fund it? Because we, as the party bureau, the, the, at the head of the International Energy Agency, has said rightly recently, it's time to start absorbing carbon out of the air. Otherwise, we, we will fail to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to avoid uh, the, the, this catastrophe of global warming. We have to start. And how to find it? Only one way. Only one way which is uh, totally compatible with the, the main principle that polluters have to pay for the pollution. It is the price of carbon. And the price of carbon, which is high enough in order to fund this absorption, starting the absorption of carbon in the air. People have to understand that. It is the life on Earth which is, which is at stake. So it's very, very serious. And we need funds. Where we, we, we find funds? Through taxes? We don't have the funds. Too, too, too much fun. The only way is to put the price of carbon. And that will make a two incent an, an incentive to shift to uh, less use of uh, decarbonization in the energy sector in the first place. And the second, it will give the, 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 the fund uh, to start and maybe to decarbonize, to, 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 to get carbon out of the atmosphere, which is absolutely necessary. Thank you, Edmond, for your passionate intervention there. Um, Alexandra, I'm going to give over to you to briefly give your wrap up. What do you expect from the COP in Glasgow uh, and your final thoughts? Well, uh, to keep it uh, simply, what we expect is um, sound results, collective will, uh, NDCs at least from the major emitters and um, building on a real way to action, taking on uh, Mr. on face uh, reiterated uh, settlement. Se se the point is, sorry, uh, the point is that um, we, I, I was thinking about Mr. Alfondri uh, was saying right now, and uh, it's it's pretty obvious for us that uh, the CCS is likely to be very relevant, a very relevant field of action, and uh, a field to build on improved R and D. Uh, I believe we will not be able to meet the targets without. Uh, making serious job on the carbon uh, capture and storage. Uh, by the way, uh, in Portugal, our carbon tax rose from 509 euros in 2015 to 23.62 euros in 2020. So uh, we, we are in line with what you were saying. Uh, another point that I would like to raise is that because uh, I was not speaking on behalf of the council, I want to, to say it again. But uh, in the last years, uh, Portugal grew economically more than the EU average, but uh, our emissions have uh, dropped 41% since 2005. So this means basically that green transition is compatible with green, uh, with growth, economic growth, and job creation, and also 
with reducing the need to import food, fossil fuel. And this, I believe, is also a common ground uh, between the EU, generally speaking, and China. So, yes, some of the challenges that we face today are new and require strategic reflection. However, we, we also believe that uh, there is no realistic alternative than to address these challenges following what we have always used to do in our relationship with China, that is dialogue, patience, determination, long-range long strategic vision and realism on how far we can influence and unite together and then from where we must accept to live with some differences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Byford, uh, we are running short of time, so if you can briefly give me your closing thoughts. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, yeah thanks. So I think it's been a very stimulating conversation and, and a lot of good points raised, but I um, just want to raise a, a, a number of reflections. So I think there was a point about uh, making all financial flows compatible with the climate goals. Um, so I think that's, that's very important. So it's not only climate finance, but also all public finance from international financial institutes, institutions, um, multilateral banks, um, and, and, and private finance as well. And secondly, um, Mr. Leitao pointed out the, the, the importance of, of a fair uh, and just transition. I think that's very important. And that's also uh, very important for, for China as well, because if we look at some of the provinces like in Inner Mongolia or Sanchi, there are a large portion of the uh, economy is still dependent on fossil fuel. So we need to think about how do we transition uh, in, a, in a fair and just way and how perhaps EU and China can work together on, on that front as well. Um, and then and then just just finally, uh, like, like, like I pointed out, I think this year is, is going to be a historic year of, of climate cooperation, but also to demonstrate that well, not only the Paris Agreement is alive, but also multilateralism and international cooperation is, 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 is alive and also credible, and it works for uh, everyone. So I will, I, will, I, will, I will end there. Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping it brief. Hei Jing Zhang, just very, very shortly, very briefly, your final remarks. Okay. Uh, last uh, opening, let me introduce our research initiative for the collaborative transformation between Chinese city and the energy company. Mm. The, the, the initiative will carry out research and uh, planning for the Chinese city to achieve carbon peak and carbon neutrality and design a series of the energy design environmental protection investment project about carbon week and carbon neutrality. So uh, I welcome uh, the technology of the Europe and welcome the investment from the uh, Europe. Uh, and now uh, in the forum which I organized, the Swedish presentation have finished. Uh, now it is a presentation of the Finland uh, Finnish uh, green technology. So uh, welcome, welcome your uh, technology and welcome your investment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then final word, Shang Zhao, to you uh, to wrap up. Thank you, Jennifer. And I would also like to thank you and the other distinguished panelists. And I think, as we said at the beginning, this is a very important event. And, uh, and at the end of this event, I would say that this is also a very positive event, as uh, Anina mentioned just now. And this is also a very reassuring event that, uh, as Alexander just said, that despite the differences we may have, this event proves that actually we have a lot of com commonality among ourselves, like the common commitment, common goals, and common actions. And we all stand open to further cooperation and joint efforts to help tackle climate change. And uh, as I believe that uh, the European Union, one of its mottos is diversity. And as President Xi Jinping mentioned, that diversity should not become an obstacle to international cooperation. Rather, we need to draw upon the diversity in today's world. That gives us strength 
as well. So I think today's event has actually reassured all of us that uh, despite our differences, there is a lot that we can continue to work on together. And with joint efforts, we believe we can all deliver the goal of properly tackling climate change. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. And thank you for ending on such a positive note. It is a nice way to finish up this morning's discussion. Thank you all very much. And thank you, our audience, for viewing, of course, climate change, something that affects us all. So I am sure this is a conversation we will continue to have in the future. And of course, you can follow on social media by following the hashtag EA Debates. And join us again here on Your Active for more insightful conversations soon.